uh, event of our fall series, and uh, we've been working to put together some really interesting events. So I, I hope you all will come back uh, next month and, and the succeeding months this fall. Uh, there are a couple of things I should, uh, a couple of housekeeping things. Uh, the bathrooms are way back there on by the uh, on the other side of the classroom, down down the main hall that you came down. Uh, I want to give thanks to M Hub for hosting the space. I uh, really appreciate them uh, allowing us to use the space. I also want to give thanks to uh, Metropolitan Brewing, who is our sponsor of beer. Uh, we appreciate them providing that for us. Uh, I would also invite uh, those of you who are interested in helping with New Space Chicago and making things um, better than they already are uh, to, to volunteer. We have. A, a team of really great volunteers who have been working on um, putting things together, and uh, we can always use more help. So, if you're interested in being involved, please uh, talk to me or um, Brendan or uh, Eric, who are uh, two of our committee uh, chairs. We have we have three committees. There is a, a programming committee, an outreach committee, and a, a partnerships committee. So. Uh, we're putting together some really interesting things, and, and I look forward to your involvement. One of those things that we've been working on, um, I am very pleased to announce, is a partnership between New Space Chicago and the Edison Awards. Uh, if you are not familiar with the Edison Awards, they have been around for about 30 years, uh, celebrating innovation in all its various forms. Uh, new products, new innovations, and, and so forth. Uh, they have a number of different categories, and 2018 marks the first time that they will have a category for space-related innovations. And uh, New Space Chicago is very happy to be partnering with the Edison Awards to make this possible. Uh, and so uh, we will be helping them to identify candidates for uh, the, the Space Innovation Award, and also putting together a panel of judges uh, who will be uh, selecting the, the finalists for that award. So this is uh, really a, a major thing for New Space Chicago because the Edison Awards is a global award, uh, and so I think this will bring a significant amount of attention to the space industry in Chicago, um, as well as space activities around the world. For this evening, um, I'm very pleased to present uh, Lee Anderson. She is founder of Starkweather and uh, FAR and a designer of outerwear. And she's here to talk to us tonight about the intersection between fashion and aerospace. And when we first started talking about this, I was like, really, fashion? Um, but I, then I realized uh, Elon Musk said that the spacesuits for the people who are going to fly in the SpaceX Dragon space capsule have to be kick-ass. <laughs> well, that's fashion right there. Um, and so I was like, okay, this sounds, this sounds cool. So without further ado, let me present the Anderson. Thank you to New Space for giving me the opportunity to share with you all, and thank you for being here. My name is Lee Anderson. I'm the founder of Stark Weather, where we design outerwear, among other things. And while the focus of Stark Weather has always been designing outerwear for the urban environment, a personal goal of mine has always been to design outerwear for the most extreme outdoor environment of outer space. And that is how FAR came to be. Um, the purpose of which is really to start this discussion at a critical moment in the development of the space industry. So as David suggested, that some people might not know why that's important now. <laughs> um, but for me, it's hard not to start this conversation when you look at the number of hybrid creatives and scientists that are emerging around the world in all industries, and also the kinds of organizations that are supporting that work. And in addition to that phenomenon of hybridization, there are also some really important cultural shifts happening that are similar to what we saw during the space race in the 60s. Um, some really important milestones coming up as well. 
So we're starting to see that being reflected in pop culture and um, in different ways through uh, startups and private industry getting involved in space. The Outer Space Treaty, which is an international agreement that's being reviewed all around the world. And all signs are really pointing to the fact that we are entering into a new space age. So what does this have to do with fashion, right? That's why we're all here tonight, to learn that. Um, and the main thing that I hope to start with here is that uh, it's not new. This is a seamstress at ILC Dover sewing a component of one of the first, uh, or one of the Apollo mission spacesuits, and you can see them hanging there behind her. So ILC Dover was actually originally Playtex. It was uh, the Air Force that originally went to Playtex for them to build uh, rafts and, and canteens and things for the Army, and then eventually pressure suits and helmets for the Air Force. And then as the space program took off, Playtex split up into these different divisions, one of them being ILC Dover, which now continues to make all the space suits for uh, NASA. And that is how we got a man in space. Um, special uh, techniques and machines that were known by these lingerie makers that were able, had the capabilities of making this suit. So this is Buzz Aldrin, taken by Neil Armstrong on the moon, 1969. And this is actually taken in 2013. This is a shot at ILC Dover. Um, just to point out that one of the main differences in the suits now is that they're made up of component parts. Uh, whereas before, like for Buzz and Neil, they were custom made for each astronaut. They're now making them in modular, uh, like the legs, the arms, the torso, the gloves are all sized differently, so you can kind of piece it together to fit the different astronauts. Uh, this is Peggy Whitson on one of her final spacewalks. She's now returned to Earth a couple of weeks ago from her most recent mission on the ISS. But um, you can see that her suit actually doesn't look that different from Buzz Aldrin's in 1969. So it's kind of an interesting observation. And um, to be fair, there are some pretty funky ideas about what we should be wearing or could be wearing right now that I'm not totally on board with. Um, and Hollywood likes to show us these body conscious versions that are totally unrealistic but look really good on these actors. Uh, but there are some suits that are coming out from the private industry, like this on the left from uh, David Clark for Boeing. And you can see kind of similarities. They have been a contractor for NASA also since the 50s. So that suit kind of follows the same blueprint of the uh, ILC Dover suits that we just saw. Whereas on the right, this suit by Y3 for Virgin Galactic is clearly they have different priorities, right? Even in the way that the photo is taken, there's an intention behind it. Um, important to note also, that is not an EPA suit, that is a flight test pilot suit, so there are limitations as well in where we can push the aesthetic side for the moment, but that is happening. And of course this example, the long-awaited uh, SpaceX flight suit, again not an EVA suit, it's used for launch for the Dragon, or will be used for launches on the Dragon capsules. Not a whole bunch of detail yet on all of that, but also to your point David, everyone looks better in a tux. So the point, and it's really valid, that when you see that suit from SpaceX, you want to wear that. You want to look like that, and then you want to go to space. So these thoughts kind of, it's sequential, and it really does galvanize people and get uh, more of us interested in, in space in general. So it's a really effective tool, actually, for the space industry. Um, and if anyone reads the Reddit threads, you might have seen this reference. Um, I like to think there's a little bit of death punk in these suits, and if there is, then if we follow that, there might be some personalization coming down the line, so to be uh, to be announced. But just to back up a little bit, it's fair to say that things haven't changed a lot because there are some very serious requirements that are totally non-negotiable non and um, actually are life and death when it comes to designing these suits. So we can talk fashion all day, but it really does come down to the safety of the astronauts. And at the time of the first suits, and really still where we are today, there are a huge number of materials and different layers and components to these suits that actually make them work. 
If you think about um, temperature control, pressurization, communication, um, the list goes on about how you need this to be a self-sustaining vehicle, basically, for astronauts. Um, what's interesting about that, if we think about fashion and kind of more terrestrial things, this is a great example from DuPont, which is a textile uh, manufacturer. These are about a dozen materials that they actually had um, in spacesuits for the Apollo missions that are used in everyday things that we wear today, like nylon for stockings or lycra for your bathing suit. And I love the example of Velcro also, a very basic material that we kind of take for granted here but is totally indispensable in space where you have zero gravity and somehow need to keep things in place. Um, so little bits of Velcro attached to your book and disc man actually help you keep things organized in your cabin. Um, or this watch from Commander David Scott that was custom made. He clearly need, he had his own style to express himself, um, but it was they made the regulation for the Velcro to fit around his wrist when he's not wearing his suit, and then also big enough that he could wear it around his fully pressurized EVA suit. Um, okay, so even if it's very complex and there are all these different components, there are a lot of opportunities now that the private industry is getting involved in the space, space race of today. And so some of these component parts are being addressed separately. Um, this was a call or a submission for a launch proposal, and I'll mention launch later on. But one uh, compression suit example is this knit uh, composite material where on different areas of the body, different materials are focused. So Kevlar or silicon are more concentrated to give you more mobility in one area, more constriction in another area. And the same concept is being used here in this suit that's maybe a little bit more well known. This is Dava Newman from MIT. Uh, this actually was made in collaboration with NASA, but also Danessi, which is an Italian motorcycle company. And they reached out to Danessi because all of these lines that you see on the suit are lines of non-extension, which basically means there, there are lines along our body that neither contract nor expand while we move. And the suit follows those lines. So it's fully, uh, the, the, it can be compressed and pressurized just along those lines, and the rest of it is totally flexible. But that makes it really effective, really form-fitting, and actually pretty cool. Like, this is very Hollywood. Um, so we're moving in the right direction, I think. Here's another example from Danessi. I put the motorcycle jacket there just so you can see kind of what their expertise is. Uh, that is their bread and butter, the safety gear for motorcyclists. And the suit on the left was actually commissioned by the ESA. Um, they had a bunch of astronauts coming back down to Earth with herniated discs and spending weeks and weeks in recovery and trying to figure out what was happening to them. They hypothesized that when you're in zero G, their spines were literally stretching, um, and then they would come back down to Earth and the force of gravity would like compress it down again, but it would be misaligned. So this suit has a rigid material all across the shoulders and um, torso and the yoke, and then the stirrups under the feet, similarly rigid, and then the nylon, uh, strips that you see going down the body. So it basically keeps you in your form that you're meant to be in from the time you take off from Earth and return. And it's a motorcycle company that they came to for this. This is a pretty cool example, although not space related right now. It's actually meant for the elderly community, but it was developed based on some technology that was meant for DARPA uh, to help with when soldiers are exerting themselves to t relieve some of that exhaustion. So it's a, if you think about a, an electric bike that kind of supplements your pedaling with extra power, that's basically what this suit does. It's a wearable robotic that enhances or gives like a boost to all of your uh, muscular, like the energy that's exerted when you move your muscles. So that could extend the active life of people for several years, actually, which is a pretty cool thing for healthcare, for psychological well-being, and lots of things, and could help a lot with eventual space applications as well. Um, this is a really cool example looking the other way from space to Earth. Uh, aerogel is used, one, as a thermal insulator, but also as a um, kind of 
filter to collect celestial dust, um, especially from comets, which is really hard to capture and separate from the material. Um, that thermal insulator, it's, it is the lightest solid on Earth. Um, it, is, it is actually very cool if you can get your hands on some. I know a friend over here has a sample. Uh, they actually turned that, that solid into an insulator that can be used in products. So this fabric that you see, this textile, is the lightest insulator that exists, and it's also the one with the most integrity using basically zero loft. So if you think about uh, most of your winter clothing has some kind of down or um, a synthetic filling in it, and once it, when it gets old, it kind of compresses and it loses a lot of its uh, insulation and power integrity. It will not happen with the aerotherm because it has like 98% integrity with its loft, um, and so it's a pretty revolutionary material. And if you think about that in like Arctic expeditions and things, not only are you going to be warmer than ever, but it's actually a lot lighter than any of the gear that you would have had before. So this exploration of materials and manufacturing has led to a couple of organizations that are bringing together academia, private industry, and the government. Launch, I mentioned before, uh, was one of the, made, had a call for proposals for new compression suits, but they focus on sustainability efforts in manufacturing and in textiles, whereas AFOA concentrates on new advancements in material science. But definitely keep your eye on these two organizations to see some cool things coming out. Um, and some really cool corporate partners as well, like Nike is a big partner of the Launch Initiative, and um, North Face and like Blue Water Defense uh, with AFOA. So these advancements in material science um, are also important for another reason that I've kind of alluded to, uh, that these things will benefit us not only on Earth, but also in space and vice versa. So as we t like develop them here, test them there, develop them there, test them here, we now have this dialogue happening between Earth and space that's pretty unprecedented. And there are designers that are participating in all of that now, um, going back to the idea of hybridization. So the results are literally universal, which is pretty cool. Uh, one last example is this space fabric that came out of uh, NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. So did the aerogel, actually. Um, but this is made with, with what they call 4D printing, and that fourth dimension is functionality, actually. So each side of this cubic fabric has a different function, like tensile strength, or foldability, or uh, temperature regulation. And I actually just love how it reminisces this look from Paco Rabanne, from the space age fashion of the 1960s, which kind of brings me into this next segment of the talk. Um, we've looked at a lot of the materials, but space and fashion have had a dialogue on a whole other level as well. And um, these looks from the space age, we saw Paco Rabanne earlier, and uh, Pierre Cardin on the right, and then Andre Courage is another one who was impactful in this movement. And their goal was basically to get away from um, the typical silhouette of the era and using materials and silhouettes that were pretty revolutionary and kind of shocking to people. So we saw the metallic chainmail earlier and this uh, metallic chain link jacket and these kind of odd cutouts on the look to the right. So while today we still have some of these space references in fashion. It's a lot less experimental in some ways. I call this space as applique because it's basically a surface design that calls on the storytelling power of space, but it's more just about evoking this sense of wonder and exploration um, that fashion also has a power for. But if you take away the motifs of space on this skirt and sweater, you just have a really good looking outfit, basically. It doesn't push any boundaries or shock in the same way that the space age fashion did. Um, but we also have this whole new sector of the fashion industry, mostly referred to as fashion tech. Um, a few examples here. This is, uh, these are both from a Nook Whiprect, 
They're not the most wearable things, but they represent this new, <laughs> no? Um, they represent this new um, territory that's being embarked on. The one on the left is a holographic dress that has adaptive camouflage. So depending on, you can see it kind of mimics what's being projected on the wall behind her. Um, and the one on the left is, or the right, is a prosthetic. Uh, Anouk worked a few times with this musician, Victoria, who um, uses her prosthetic in her performances. So while she's on stage, she has this leg that creates this vapor that becomes a whole part of her persona. And another one that they made together is an actual musical instrument. So it's a prosthetic that has an extension that kind of comes up around her body and she can play it while she's performing, which is really, really cool. Um, these two examples are from separate designers. On the left, um, Iris Van Herpen, who's from the Netherlands, and Neri Oxman, who's a designer out of MIT Media Lab, collaborated on this dress. And on the right, 3S4 and Travis Finch, who are all based in New York. 3S4 is a pretty experimental fashion label. Um, I show these together because both of them were printed and manufactured by Strassus. And this is relevant and interesting because Strassus is actually a 3D printing um, manufacturer an additive printing manufacturer. Um, one of the main industries that they service, oops, went the wrong way. One of the main industries that they service is the aerospace industry. So where in the 60s we had NASA and the Air Force looking at apparel manufacturers for expertise that they did not have in their own laboratories, we now have fashion designers looking to aerospace manufacturers for capabilities that they don't have in their studios. So again, we're starting these conversations that right now are quite experimental, but they really do show us kind of where we could go and how far we could take it. Um, I think this is a lot like Elon Musk's uh, sentiment about how everyone looks better in a tux. There's something more than just the garment about fashion. You really are telling stories, or you have the power to do that through clothing. Um, that's done through movies and entertainment, but it's also done in how we dress every day. This look from Gareth Pugh, equally not very wearable, I <laughs> think, but he's known for these kind of eccentric runway shows, and um, it's, it's fun in fashion. You can be free to tell stories like that, and that could be a really powerful tool in the collaboration between fashion and the space industry. Um, if they can, with, anyway, we'll, we'll come back to that, but, um, we've talked a lot about the tangible aspects now, so the materials and the products and the manufacturing behind the space industry and the fashion industry. Uh, another thing that we are really concerned with at FAR is the well-being of people when we start um, moving into space and when more long-term missions are um, assigned to people other than the astronauts, like business people, teachers, children in space. What does that end up looking like, or sounding like, or smelling like in those environments? Um, we have this sense of kind of curiosity and creativity that's evoked from space and also from fashion, where, like, why are we going to the stars? Like, it's just a thing that we have in us innately. And I think that that's, it's really important for us to maintain that. And through fashion and through the arts, it's one way that we can continue to find ways to express it as we move forward. Um, the other thing that is really exciting, but also um, will be a huge challenge moving forward, is that space is non-sovereign territory. So all cultures um, will have to feel at home. And even if you look at the main um, space programs in the world right now, Europe, China, Russia, America, totally different cultures. So how do we reconcile that? And fashion definitely comes into play, as will a lot of other things like language and food and art, um, music. But to kind of wrap this up, I started out by saying that this uh, relationship and dialogue between fashion and aerospace is not new, but this territory we are working on actually is entirely new and it's really exciting so it's up to us right now to kind of to mold it and create it all together um, all disciplines need to be around the table um, 
fashion as well as engineering and technology. And um, the goal right now is basically just to set the intention and priorities. So I think of fashion as sort of a language that we can use to spread the interest in space and also remember that we are human and we have um, like very real needs that relate to how we live here on Earth and how we can maintain that in space and build new environments that actually enrich that and maintain our well-being. Um, that is important. So how is this new reality possible? Um, that is a really big question, and I think just by being here, uh, we really just have to start somewhere. <laughs> so thank you guys for coming. Um, I am so glad you're all here. I will take any questions that you have, and um, that's all. space and exploration and that level of passion, has that directly, or do you have any examples where that's actually directly impacted designs or any work you've done here in your actual, what I, I, would, I would call like the, 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 main, the main capacity that you operate here? Yeah, yeah actually, um, very directly, I've worked with uh, Final Frontier Designs, which is an aerospace company based out of Brooklyn. Um, they uh, basically operate based on NASA contracts which are few and far between because there's just not a huge market for what they build. Um, they got started making gloves and uh, they make safety gear now, but they were trying to develop ways to create a commercial channel for themselves in like waiting for the space industry to create a bigger market for itself. Um, so we made a couple of products together, outdoor products using materials that they use in, um, in their space safety gear suits. So that was really cool. Uh, and a, I would say another good example of how I felt the need for the fashion industry really uh, resonated with them because that was where they were gonna, were gonna place their products, whether it was backpacks and things that they were also making or this outerwear. And also the idea of space really sells to people. So when you start um, even just saying this jacket was designed in a space suit laboratory, like people want to buy that. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, sure. Uh, uh, could you talk a little bit about the durability of the newer kind of designs? Because I, I, I believe that, like, I know at least like NASCAR suits, the, the space, the, sorry, the flame retardant ones, like, at least when they started, they weren't very durable. And I'm not sure about where that's going. I think the aerogels, at least when they started, were like super not durable. Right. Where is that at? Um, there, a lot of these things are still being tested, like, and some of the examples that I used are really just prototypes, like even the suit from Donna Newman and the knit compression suit, those aren't out in the market, but um, the, the motorcycle, um, the suit with the like restrictive shoulders and the nylon, that ha actually has been tested um, a couple of times, I think, by now. It, like the first one in 2014, and every opportunity they have in a European astronaut on the space station, they set them up with that. Um, so durability-wise, I'm not, they're not necessarily put under the most rigorous conditions right now, but uh, that is one example that's actually out being, like, out in use right now. Um, I wonder if I can answer that more specifically, but if I come up with something, I will I'll let you know. Sure. Yeah. Looking into? Yeah, I actually have a resource list that I wanted to check with these guys about how to send out to you, which is probably the best way. Um, like a bunch of articles of, uh, that can give you a lot of really good information, if that's cool. Okay, good. Yes. I know you listed a bunch of constraints that are functional constraints, mm -hmm. like temperature control, radiation protection, all that stuff. When you come up with one of these cool new designs, how do you test that everything's going to work? Before I was, you know, what, what, what's the testing methodology before you say, all right, now we're setting this one up here? Uh, things are tested up there, actually. So um, some of these 
objects are brought up, they're tested in space without anyone wearing them, like a radiation thing, for example, right? Is that? Yeah. It's yeah. Easy, yeah. So instead of sending someone out there in something that's untested, um, they'll test the materials in space and do iterations based on that. So the space station is actually really, uh, I mean, it's very valuable to us right now for that reason, uh, for materials and textiles and everything. Yeah. Sure. Uh, I found it really interesting uh, how you talked about how the textile industry originally had the technology and informed the space uh, race or, or the space age back in the 60s and now it's kind of reversed. The, the aerospace industry has the, the information and uh, you know, the textile industry is kind of learning from the aerospace industry. Is, is there any sort of means or mechanisms uh, to be able to share that information more freely? Uh, or like how, how is that information flow? Is it usually just kind of been uh, kind of on a one-off basis? Yeah, totally. That's actually one of the main goals of this organization of FAR, is to help connect designers and the resources and vice versa. Um, AFOA, for example, has um, probably a hundred members at this point between academia and private industry, and they have no database actually of what materials exist, although some really, really, really cool materials exist. Um, like, I, they have fibers that could make a shirt where you and I could communicate across the room without actually like looking at each other, talking to each other. So it's like built-in walkie-talkies, basically. Things like that that aren't on the market yet, but if people knew that that capability was there, they might find a use case and be able to scale it to the point where it was actually commercially viable. Um, so those channels aren't totally open yet, but organizations like Launch and AFOA are doing really cool things um, in their niches to help make that happen. But like the examples that I showed of Ears and Herpin and 3S4, they're definitely like scouring the internet, asking all their contacts, like who do you know who can make this thing? And they're working with a company that's on the other side of the ocean from them, right? So um, it's not perfect, but like people are finding ways, which is encouraging. Just a follow-up question. Is there, is there an IP uh, issue there, like, like uh, you know, the aerospace companies are, is, yeah. are they concerned about sharing, you know, you know, specific information that might be you know, protected or? I would imagine that's case by case, and um, I have had to sign a couple of these, but it's usually just because you're, you're, you're seeing information that might not be relevant to the thing that you're building, but it's, um, it's necessary to the process. So I'm sure there's a lot of that, um, even just visiting the factories and things. But um, I think they're also excited to find new uses for their machinery. I think that's really the biggest benefit of it. Um, sure. Yeah. If I could interject, <clears throat> the, the, the question that you bring up in terms of kind of the information flow between uh, the space uh, industry and sort of non-space industry, that goes, you know, that, you know, valves, electronics, and all kinds of products and technologies. One of the, one of our ambitions for New Space Chicago is to become kind of a, a clearinghouse for, for um, startups to help navigate some of that, help find that information, and uh, to help facilitate that for folks here. Because obviously Chicago um, doesn't have a, as deep a history as some other places in terms of folks with that experience. So we want to be the place to help do that. You know, there are. You know, it, it depends on the domain, whether it's fashion or, you know, interesting, you know, valves or, you know, what, whatnot, right, that they're a resource, and that's one of the ambitions that we have for this group. That's great. Um, yes. So you touched on uh, IoT really briefly. And I was wondering, you know, as far as how the data is collected for the research uh, testing, you know, how is that collected now? And if it is collected now, how is that translated down to, you know, what, what we might use on data? Uh, in the research yeah. phase, you mean? Yeah, that's, there is so much that is possible right now that is not applicable on a day-to-day -day basis, unfortunately. Um, the biggest issue is cost and, and scalability. So, the I think it goes back to the same question of uh, the people developing the technologies, finding those who can use it and apply it, and in most cases, um, and this is like, this happens in every industry, 
but you can often be surprised by how your technology will be used. So the more visibility these companies have, the more likely they are to find that place and then develop from there. Does that answer your question? Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, as far as research that has been done, how accessible is that to the general public and the fashion industry? Or is it pretty guarded from you know, the space programs that are collected? No, I mean, if you, if you look for it, you can find it. Um, a lot of it is just really jargony, so it's not, it, but there aren't like keywords that would come to mind easily to look it up. But um, once you start digging, there's a lot of it is just in the press releases or in the case studies on the websites of these companies. So I think that's probably like with Iris Menger, but I haven't asked her how she found stresses, but I imagine it was something to do with that. And um, then saying like, here's what we have in mind. Can you make this work? Uh, that, that is like the beginning of these conversations in a lot of cases. There's been a monkey in space. <laughs> and, and a dog. Okay, yeah. Oh, so like any explanation about like other like kids or animals? Like yeah, have, have suits been built for children or animals or anything? Yeah. Um, def not kids yet. Um, and no research. Mostly there there's some serious effects on the body when you go to space that we're still trying to understand. Um, so who knows what happened to a like developing body? That's a pretty scary question right now. <laughs> but um, in time, yes. And there are like you can find tons of young people around the world right now who are training to be astronauts, basically. And they're all um, starting with like the camps and things that you go to, but they're not actually going into orbit or anything at this point. So, but yeah, we'll keep an eye out because hopefully Elon Musk will have someone design that too. I actually didn't mention, just a little aside, the suit, uh, they, they collaborated on this suit with Jose Fernandez, who's actually a superhero suit designer, so he was hired out of Hollywood. He did films like The Avengers and Iron Man, and what they did was actually reverse engineer it. So they designed, like, here's what we want it to look like, and they started there, and then worked backwards to build in the functionality. So. I thought that was a pretty cool little anecdote about the process. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of building on that, I, I, I can't remember who it was. I read an article about someone talking about how Hollywood, as, as goofy as some of their suits might be, really do innovate some concepts that you can apply for real life. And maybe it's more like a con cocktail question, but if you had your choice of projects between like actually designing a real space suit tomorrow that was going to go into space next year, or designing a concept for one that you knew would influence the design of real ones decades to come, but it was in a Hollywood film. You know, which of which of the two I would choose the latter. Uh, All right, we're going to pay. We're going to pay. Okay. Sure. One of the turns of phrase you just really um, caught my attention was talking about the dialogue between um, products developed in the four states and products developed on Earth. It's sort of the implicit conversation between that. I thought that was, that was really. Uh, interesting way to describe that. I'm wondering, I mean, we're going to see more and more of that in other things as well. I'm wondering if you can just elaborate on how that takes place and how, how those kind of beyond sort of the, the, uh, the collaborations and the highlight, which a lot of those are probably the result of um, talented people finding other specific talented people, right? I mean, like, how does that scale um, more generally and how do you see more play out? I think of these people as pioneers. Most of the examples that I used where uh, you have this moment in fashion where things aren't necessarily wearable, but they inspire people, and they're just experimenting with these new technologies, and you learn that you can 3D print these really insane things and make it into a dress. Um, when that will become really valuable to us is when we have like closed loop manufacturing, for example, where you can actually 3D print your garment and then recycle it and reprint it into something else. And there is research like that happening. That's when it'll become a lot more mainstream. Whereas right now it's really just experimental. And these companies are investing in making these things. So they still have to have a commercial business on the side that sustains those projects. Um, 
and there, then those pieces are purchased by museums, right? Uh, right, I will say, um, in this, to the development of this organization, I've had a lot of looks like total confusion about how do these things relate to each other. And um, like you saw, there are a lot of really tangible things that don't like aren't totally fashion or aren't totally space, but the overlap is really becoming more evident. Um, I think that that conversation will become easier over time, and that it will expand to other areas. Um, there's so many sectors that this involves. Like even in all of the examples that I showed tonight, um, a dozen different industries went into or like played into the development of one of those things. So. Um, yeah, I think it's going to be a really, really interesting area to watch. Yes. Does space fashion, does space fashion knowing to be essentially kind of a restart, does it create a space for kind of an egalitarian movement where we see design and ethos uniting people together and not necessarily having sweatshop versions, versions of like flash fashion, right? Or do we find that after it becomes scalable, so repeating in space fashion, what we've seen in current fashion, in layers of hierarchy. So that's a really interesting question, and I believe in the next decade the fashion industry will be completely different from what it is today, mostly because we'll have new ways to manufacture things that will be really cost effective and not uh, require slave labor. <laughs> so let's start there. Um, and then recycling as well, like using materials that are going to be a lot more um, it's just a more circular, closed loop process where right now you feel really good when you drop something off at Goodwill, but actually that thing is either ending up in a landfill or um, damaging a local economy because the, they used to make their own clothes <laughs> and sell them or something. So there are really negative effects that all of this research that's happening with the blend of technology and ethical questions and um, just really the long view in general will really benefit the environment, us, um, our well-being, um, yeah. Paul, yes. do you notice any, knowing that you know you talked a little bit about an Italian design company with motorcycle, motorcycles, do you know, do you see any kind of like cultural influence in the design that you see from multiple different countries who are pursuing space fashion? Yeah, I mean, it's early to say, I think. The, even, um, it, for the Chinese, the Beijing Olympics, they had a big display of um, an astronaut in their space suit who was kind of floated over the crowd, which was pretty cool. And it doesn't look that different at the end of the day. Um, still, we don't have a huge amount of freedom in the designs yet, and um, I hope that there will be some kind of preserving of those cultural identities. I have no idea what that's gonna look like. And it's almost a double-edged sword because like I was saying, you, everyone needs to be included. So if you end up creating different segments in a way that's not inclusive, then that's like, we'll have to look out for that, I think. So it's gonna be a really interesting um, thing to watch <laughs> as it develops. And as more, more countries become more involved in the space industry, which a lot of them are trying to do in very serious ways. Yeah. Do you think, um, or have like the specs and requirements for like space fashion or like, you know, that the suit has to handle certain stresses and engineering requirements, do you sort of see maybe, it, you know, SpaceX is sort of an early example of this, that there is a like fun factor that's sort of almost a spec now that's part, becoming part of these suits and like they need to look cool otherwise, yeah. Like, it's not enough just to be functional anymore. It has to be kind of attractive and interesting and like exciting for people. Do you think that that's sort of kind of a one-off with SpaceX or sort of a precursor of what's more to come? Totally a precursor. Like even the example from Virgin Galactic, mm -hmm. it, why, that was before the SpaceX suit. Obviously that was happening in tandem, but Y3 is a fashion label and they were hired. It's, they're like fashion, activewear, um, and the suit totally reflects that it's like, it's cool, it's like streetwear. Um, I definitely think that as 
space becomes more mainstream, that's going to be really important. And you're going to want to fly with the company that has the cool suits, because you'll have to wear their suit at the beginning, right? Um, and you'll have pictures of yourself, and you'll want to look cool. I, I think that's real. <laughs> Yes. So um, you kind of highlighted in the beginning of your talk about how um, both are, um, and I'm sure a lot of the other big aerospace companies had the opportunity to, to kind of work in the jet engine, the jet uh, pilot arena. And then when the big aerospace thing happened, they all kind of got invited to the party because they were the closest ones. Um, what do you see as your, or an entrepreneur like yourself, as your event where you can prove yourself and get invited to the party for bigger things? Like you see like maybe, uh, the space tourism industry where people are going up in balloons, you know, just about the atmosphere. Like world see. view. Yeah, world view. You see that as like maybe your chance of getting noticed and getting an opportunity to try out technologies. Um, yeah, I mean, I would love that. I, uh, I've, I've done some events with people who work with the world view people, so that's definitely on my radar personally. But I also see my role right now just as kind of spreading this. <laughs> spreading the word. Um, Design-wise, uh, to your question earlier, I love the idea of kind of getting really conceptual with it right now, where anything is possible. So why wouldn't we have um, things that are kind of drapey? And like, if you think of Star Wars, people are walking around outside with all kinds of crazy things on. Why wouldn't it be like that? Why couldn't it be like that? So I, I'm sort of in that mode myself. I'm just less practical, but it's more fun. <laughs> well, I would argue if, if you're going to pay $70,000 to go to the world view balloon, right. I'd probably want a picture of myself in a sense. Yeah. Kind of space. <laughs> <laughs> there cool. you go. Yeah. Hang on the wall, you know, and, yeah. and show it to my friends. Yeah. Um, and I do think that there are going to be small ways, even if it's like you can personalize patches or you have a separate color of some component of your suit. Probably too soon to own your own suit, but I do see a future where, um, similar to when you go skiing and you buy a suit, it could be from Bogner, it could be from North Face, or it could be from Prada. It will be like that in space as well, and you'll just have your gear. So then you could, yeah, yeah there's the future. Yeah. Yes. Do big brands, that question, um, do big, looking at some of the brands that you're talking about, you're moving forward. Um, as pioneers in this, when do big brands start picking up on it and then making it mainstream through their social media channels, through runway shows, where they start force feeding the idea of space, fashion, design at a mass scale? Right, so baby steps have been taken. Like recently, um, what is the name of the designer? It'll come to me, but Buzz Aldrin walked in a menswear fashion show recently. He was wearing just like a, a blazer and slacks, but Still, they're, they're, that, they, that was them bringing space into Fashion Week. Um, it, at one of recent Chanel show, they did the big rocket set, and a lot of the accessories had space theme. The clothes were totally the same as ever, but the set kind of evoked that story. I, I guess I had a picture of it up. Um, but I like thinking that Elon Musk actually might do a collaboration at some point. He'll, I mean, he'll probably wait, and who knows what that brand will be, but I see that happening, um, and that will be pretty major. Or like Virgin Galactic did this suit with Y3. Um, Yoji Yamamoto, who's a Japanese designer who's uh, really uh, respected all around the world, could be one of those paths as well. But again, these aren't high-tech designers. They're very traditional, um, but they have that storytelling power, and they have the following. So I see it happening there first. Um, how are we on time? Okay. Um, so kind of regarding this intersection between like functional space where it's turning into everyday kind of consumer. I mean, we all know like yeah, you, know, you just wear yoga pants around, like you probably have a good yoga, right? So that I'm thinking of like the slide with the discompression suit. Like if someone's selling a discompression suit, can I wear one? Like are, is there any crossover between you know, not already, like, okay, you have to wear this because it's the, it's the space thing, like, right. Um, the closest thing to that, honestly, are a couple companies that sell, like, bomber jackets with NASA stickers on them. <laughs> um, and they're, like, Coach, being totally ridiculous, released some, like, I don't know, $1,400 jackets recently that had NASA patches. 
um, which are cool jackets, but like that's a really big price tag to buy into the space uh, space game. And uh, the compression suit question right now, there is a compression is used for athletes all the time, right? So that's not totally new. What's specific about these is like the extra added stress that they need to uh, manage for of zero gravity. Um, so. I don't see those even being necessary on Earth right now, but those companies, if, if they find a way, that's like to the final frontier design question, if they can find a commercial channel for those products, that would be really good for them, and then it would be cool. Yeah, you bring your space here on Earth. I do, like, I think that that is coming. Yeah. Uh, so that was a little mad. That was a great question, because I think of like Omega, they have a watch for Arctic Explorers, which is gigantic red, no one would ever need. And Chad Johnson, Ocho Cinco, had it on. And I think, like, I can see the exact same thing for, for space wear. Yeah. Well, Omega is actually yeah. a really good example because they their watches are worn in space. And they actually use that for marketing. So, two very extreme environments that they have somehow managed to build their brand on. There you go. Yeah. Well, I mean, you also have people wearing those Everest Expedition jackets and all the Canadian Goose jackets right. and all this stuff. And, like, it's not that cool. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Have yeah. every SUV you've ever made. Yeah, exactly right. <clears throat> uh, okay, I will stick around for a little bit, but thank you guys again for coming thank and thanks for your awesome questions. incredible textiles and, and fabrics that are being created for space and from space. So thank you all for coming. Uh, we have the space for some time yet, so feel free to stick around, continue the conversation. Um, let me tell you, next month we have a really interesting event. Um, our friends at FRC created a video for the NASA uh, Film Festival. It's called Space Crazies, and it features some of our very own New Space Chicago folks. Uh, we're going to be screening it here. Uh, and then there'll be some interesting conversations uh, to follow that. So I hope to see you all next month. Thank you for coming.